you to turn in the word of the Lord to uh, Matthew as we continue to go through the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is the grand interpreter here in, uh, in this passage. He is the king of the kingdom and the Lord of the law and the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Uh, he says in Luke's gospel that he remember at, at the end of the resurrection day, evening, he said uh, he opened up the scriptures to the apostles, the Moses and, and the prophets, he opened them both up to them that they may uh, understand the scriptures, that the scriptures spoke of him and uh, everything would be fulfilled. And similar to that, Jesus has said that here in, in Matthew 5 and said that, that he's the fulfillment of it all. And so now he starts to, to go uh, through the law in a sense, or at least the interpretation of the law that um, uh, the scribes and Pharisees of Jesus' day Understood. Jesus is, is showing um, not so much, uh, he's not showing at all the idea that he is opposing the law of God, but he is opposing the, the teaching and the interpretation of the law of God that the scribes and Pharisees had in his day. And so Jesus takes the law uh, to a deeper level, as we've seen. The, the law reaches into our heart. It's not just the external thing to do this and not do that. Uh, as we saw with murder, it's not just the act of murder, but it's the, the heart of murder, the heart murder. And so anger and hatred are, are part of that. Or adultery, it's not just, just going and being with another person sexually. It's more than that. It, it reaches into lust and desire and fantasizing and all the rest. Jesus takes us deeper into the law. And uh, he shows us that it's not just the bodily sins, but the mental sins, the thoughts. We can sin with a thought with an idea uh, as well as but the, the action. And so Jesus shows that the righteousness of his kingdom is greater than the righteousness of these scribes who were really just seeing things on the surface. They were, they were seeing things as, as externals only. And they were being hyper literalistic. They were, they were not reaching into the heart, which is always there. Jesus teaches us about our hearts. Our actions are important, yes, but our hearts are just as important. And so Jesus explains how uh, this happens in six different, there's six of them in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, these six contrasts or antitheses that he gives between their teaching and his teaching. Um, Jesus is, is not pitting himself against the law here. He's not pitting himself against Moses or, or, or the Old Testament. He's saying that God's law uh, says more than what they're saying. And so when, he, when you, we hear that phrase, uh, you have heard it said, it's, it's not just about the, the quotation of the law. It's, a, it's to be understood as, as the, the teaching of these, these, these teachers, really false teachers in Jesus' day and, and their meaning of it. He's contrasting himself and his kingdom with all of that. And so here the word of the Lord, we've, we've seen uh, a number of these already with uh, two, we've taken, but now I want to take two in the same week. I hope we can do that. So you have to think two, but I think they're together. They, they have, a, have a connection with one another. So here the word of the Lord, and this is uh, the word of the Lord from Matthew chapter five, uh, beginning at verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oaths. I'm sorry, forgive me. I'm jumping here. I want to start at verse 31. So let's come back up to 31. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a woman so divorced commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, or for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black, Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word and all that it, it, it says here. 
Lord, it's not a passage, Lord, that we would normally gravitate toward, and yet you want us to have the whole thing. You want us to have all of your word, not just the questions that we have or thoughts we might have and be drawn to, but you want us to have the complete word of God. And so you've given that to us, Lord, in the scriptures, and you've given to us this, this, this passage. And we pray, Lord, that you would speak to us, speak to us. We ask, God, that you would speak through your word, by your spirit, to our hearts. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Fame is a vapor. Popularity, an accident. The money has wings. The only thing that endures is character. Do you know who said that? It's a quote from O.J. Simpson. (laughs) Character, integrity, fidelity cannot be spoken into being by us. It can't be gained by scoring touchdowns or by dodging convictions. It's formed by what we do and don't do, by how we live day in and day out, of who we are over a lifetime. One person put it this way, integrity is not only the way one thinks, but even more the way one acts. Simply put, integrity is doing what you said you would do. It is as basic as keeping your word and fulfilling your promise. And the next two antitheses here, this one on divorce and one on oaths, speak of and deal with this character and this integrity and this fidelity of our lives, that, that, that they are both about keeping something. They're, they're both really about keeping vows, marital vows or otherwise. They're both about keeping our word. And the scribes and the Pharisees had lost this, and Jesus wants his disciples never to lose this. And so look at the first one with me. The first antithesis speaks of fidelity in marriage. And the scribes and Pharisees, they had a, an ongoing debate, as that can happen in any church or any group of people. And the, the debate was, uh, when, when was divorce allowable? And like most debates, they have two sides, two camps. And they had that too here. Two different rabbis in Jesus' day were quoted. Two different traditions. The first rabbi was Shammai. And he said that you can only divorce because of adultery. But then he went on to define, a lot of times this is not mentioned by pastors, but he went on to define what adultery was as really any kind of looseness of sorts sexually. In fact, this is a quotation from one who is quoting from, from uh, the Mishnah and, and whatnot. Uh, like going outside with a woman's hair unfashioned or spinning cloth in the street with armpits uncovered. Now that's not too much of a temptation to see armpits today. Uh, but that was thought of as the looseness um, sexually. And so Rabbi Shammai w- uh, would, would say that. Or even bathing in the same place as men, which I would agree with, that that's not a, a good thing for any person to do. But the other, the other rabbi was a rabbi called Hillel. And this was the prevailing view in Jesus' day. And it said that a man can divorce his wife, not a wife or her husband, but a man can divorce his wife for anything that displeases him. For speaking disrespectfully, you could be divorced. For quarreling, you could be divorced. Even for burning breakfast, you could be divorced in Jesus' day. Needless to say, there were lots and lots of divorces. There were. They were very loose in Jesus' day about divorce. The man held it all and he could say and just give a certificate of divorce. Now that's in the scriptures. When you look at Deuteronomy chapter 24, it says if a man marries, verse one, a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house and if she leaves his house and she becomes the wife of another man and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her to her out of the house, or if he dies, then the first husband who divorced her 
is not allowed to remarry again. Now notice that passage. This is the passage they were going back to because we know that they quote it in Matthew chapter 19 to Jesus. And notice that this is the only passage that talks about divorce in the Pentateuch. It doesn't command divorce. It doesn't demand it. It allows it. It's a concession. It assumes that divorce will happen at times and then it regulates it according to the nation of Israel. And it regulates it by this certificate, which would would basically protect, it was a protective certificate for a woman so that she could go on and she could remarry someone else. And it was a certificate that that kept her from exploitation. And the only command in the passage I just read to you is the command not to remarry. And you might think, why wouldn't that be a good thing that she could come back eventually to her original wife and, and remarry him? Why, why is remarriage not allowed? Well, it seems to be that the Lord gave that word as a deterrent to not be hasty in divorce. It's saying, uh, if you send her away, that's it. It's over. There's no second chances, no playing games, no toying with her heart. If you have a good reason to divorce her, You have no good reason to take her back. You have to be careful with this. You'd better have a good reason in the very first place. And that seems to be what's going on there. But the scribes and Pharisees weren't asking the question about remarriage. They were asking the question about what does really indecent mean? What does that really mean? And they came to Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. And some Pharisees came to him to test him. And they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Again, they were asking that question. Is, what's, what does it mean to be indecent? And it really became, came down to indecent was displeasing to the husband. And so Jesus is, is contrasting their interpretation of Deuteronomy 24, their interpretation of indecency with his broader understanding of marriage of the, that, that, the basic marriage. And he goes back in the scriptures and he says, that not, it wasn't that way from the beginning. Remember, he, he says that later in, in the verses following Matthew 19, 3. He says, it wasn't that way from the beginning that he made man and, and woman to be together and to be one flesh together. So Jesus is bringing them back to that. And Jesus says divorce for any and every reason causes people actually to commit adultery. Why? Because they're still married in God's eyes. Jesus is saying that that the scribes and Pharisees ran to Deuteronomy 24 to justify their their divorces. But he says, but I say to you, there's only one reason for a divorce and it can be justified as marital unfaithfulness. Jesus is saying this loose interpretation of Deuteronomy 24 must stop with my disciples. It must stop with them. You see, Jesus goes back to the basics. He goes back to the beginning. And he says, it was because of the hardness of your heart that, that, that Moses made that law. That was a, a, I would take it being a national law. It was a national law for that time, for them at that point, because of their hardness of heart that they would not stay with their wives. And so Jesus is taking in the whole picture and he's, he's, oh, he's saying that, 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 that death is really the only thing that stops a marriage except for sort of a possibly spiritual death or emotional death through marital unfaithfulness. Jesus wants his people to stop divorcing for any reason. He wants his people to stop being selfish in their marriages. He wants Jesus, Jesus wants us to be not to, to, to divorce for convenient reasons or for any and all. And any old reason, he's saying, come back to the beginning. Come back to the way God planned it. That's the way God planned it. That's the way he wants it to be. In the words of Billy Preston, he said, um, start fighting for your marriage. Stop complaining about your marriage. Remember that God hates marriage, divorce, loves marriage. And we should hate it as well. And so the, the point, I think what Jesus is saying here is, is, is that we should do anything and everything to save our marriage, to improve our marriage, to build our marriage. And I've sat with a number of couples over the years 
Christian couples that one or maybe both want to want a divorce. And this, there's an old saying that goes, if there's a will, there's a way. And I've, in longer version of that, told them that. If you want to stay together, if you feel that the Lord would have you stay together, look at the scriptures. What does he want you to do? Then, th- then he'll provide a way for that. So oftentimes there's no will anymore. Particularly when there's been marital unfaithfulness. But it's so tempting in our culture. We live in an, an easy divorce culture. Uh, easy divorce, no fault divorce. Someone did a survey and found out that eight of 10 people in America are touched directly or indirectly by divorce. It's everywhere. And the statistics today are, are, are better off than they used to be 20 years ago. That has gone down slightly, but probably the only reason that's so is that people are living together first And so those people that would have been married and then split up are not recorded anymore. But it's certainly true since 1962 that the divorce rate has doubled. There's a divorce in America every 42 seconds. And people are discouraged. People think that there's no hope that a marriage can get to a certain point where the best thing is to do is just to to part company. I read something uh, when Jennifer Aniston, the, the actress, and her handsome actor husband, Brad Pitt, broke up. One, one fan put it this way, I can't tell you how many people have said to me, if they can't make it, who can? Who can? There's a discouragement about marriage. There's that even built in to our culture now is to say that marriages have a, a, a time frame to them and then you just have to wake up to that time frame and when it's over, it's over. Jesus says, no. That's not the way my disciples are to think about marriage and divorce. And the good news is that many of the disciples do. I've, I've heard the statistic that, that the rate of divorce is the same thing as, as, as for the Christian world as it is for the secular world. And I read an article this week that counters that with, with, with saying the studies are showing now that, that if you are a member of a church of active conservative Protestant, they put it in the quotes, and you regularly attend church, you have a 35% less likelihood to divorce than anyone else. Does that mean that you come to church all the time and your marriage will be fine? Of course not. It's more complicated than that. It's not that simple. It takes work. But I think the statistics shows that, that God's people are willing to, to, to take that and, and to, to have that work and to work on their marriage. Let me just briefly, before we go to the next, give, give you just a couple of things that, that have helped Gail and I and have helped me through the years. Every marriage has its conflicts. Every marriage has its points where you wonder, is this it? Well, one thing we have coveted it together is never to use the D word. You know, there's certain words that we shouldn't use, right? Well, the D word is one of them. The divorce word. It's not about, don't even, that's not even an option. We're committed to Christ. And therefore we're committed to each other. So let, how can we work this out? What do we need to do? What do I need to do? To make this work. I've sat with couples that, are, that, are, that have had, um, actually over the years, I was, I was just thinking back, of the couples that I've met with that, that there's been adultery in the, in the marriage that are Christians the vast majority of them stayed together. The vast majority of them found a way together, even through that thing. So even though marital unfaithfulness is allowed, we have to be very careful with it. It's not just an ipso facto, you go that, that far and this marriage is over. No, God, Christ would want us to go back to the beginning, Lord, together, one flesh for life. So don't use that word. God has placed you with this person, not to mention you've chosen them in the first place. And, and this is his providence, that you're together, even though you have a marriage with problems, even though uh, you sin against each other. It still doesn't change the fact that you're married. 
Be a peacemaker, even in your home. We talked about the disciples of Christ, the Beatitudes, that we are peacemakers. We need to see ourselves as peacemakers. Are we there to get our own way? Are we there to, to get our own this or that? Or are we there as Christ's representative, as a peacemaker in your home, to care and love for each other? Don't, don't look for your spouse. And the third thing, I'll stop there. Don't look for your spouse to meet your needs that only God can meet. So oftentimes people put on their spouse what only God can give them. And be careful. We need to be careful. I think there's a tendency in the, in the church to take Christ so literally to say then, well, if, if they go and commit adultery, then this marriage is over and that's it. And we're not gonna even talk about it anymore. No. No, that wouldn't be our Lord's, our Lord's thinking about this. You know, one of the early church fathers linked the, this passage with the Beatitudes, which I just did a minute ago, and he said, for, the, for he that is meek and a peacemaker uh, and poor in spirit and merciful, how shall he cast out his wife? If you're a peacemaker and you're, and you're a person who's merciful and you're a person who is poor in spirit and know you're a sinner too and you've sinned, maybe not in that physical way, but you've sinned in your heart against your wife, can't you, can't you forgive? Can't you forgive? Remember how many times the Lord forgave Israel over and over his bride. He forgave her. Are we not to forgive one another? If very possible, and I'm not saying that there's no reason for ever a voice, but a divorce, but, but we have to be very careful. We are not quick to divorce ever, that it's the last resort in every case. Okay, that's what I wanted to say about divorce. That's why I think the Lord would have us hear about this passage. Now, let's, Jesus moves on to a related character attribute with his people, another way of showing integrity, showing what we are to be. And we're not only to keep our vows, our marriage vows, we're to keep our word at all times. We vow a marriage vow, but we really aren't to be a person who needs vows at all. Now, I'm not saying that marriage ceremonies should never have vows. I'm not saying that at all, but, but, but they, we're not to be people that have to, to swear by someone or swear by this or that for people to believe us. Again, Jesus is making a contrast here as well with the Pharisees. Uh, he's summarizing this. And he's not quoting one particular verse from the Old Testament. He's quoting a couple verses. Think of Numbers 30, verse 2. When a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to oblate himself by a pledge, he must not break his word, but must do everything he said, there's several passages, like Jesus seems to be summarizing those passages as he speaks. There's nothing wrong with those passages. It was the way the scribes and Pharisees were interpreting these passages. They were using oaths as a way of not keeping your word. They're designed so that you would keep your word. They were using it in the exact opposite way of breaking your word. Because everyone agreed in Jesus' day that if you made a vow in the name of the Lord, that you had to keep it. But what if, you've, what if you made a vow or an oath without mentioning the name of the Lord? What, 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 what then? And Jesus is saying all oaths are binding because all words should be true from us. They were saying oaths sworn by, by heaven or earth or Jerusalem or my head can be broken. It's almost like the, you know, I'll make a promise to you, but, but I got this behind my back. I've got the fingers crossed, right? I didn't really make a promise. It just sounded like I did. And Jesus is saying, if you made a promise by heaven, keep it because heaven is God's throne. If you made a promise by earth, keep it because earth is God's footstool. If you've made a promise by Jerusalem, keep it because Jerusalem is God's city. If you've made a, a promise by your head, keep it because the color of your hair can't even be changed by you. It's all part of God's design. You get the point there, that all things belong to the Lord, that everything is run by him in his world, and it's his world that we live in, 
Therefore, all oaths are oaths before God. All words are words before God. And therefore, all oaths are binding. They were trying to separate God from creation. There's a good sense in which we do that because they're not synonymous. But, but God is the, but the point here is that God is the God of all creation. That God is intertwined with all that you say and you do. That he sees you. You can't fool him. I can't fool him. And so just speak the truth, Christian. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Just keep your word. Anything more than that comes from the father of lies, comes from evil. It's moving into that realm of evil. It's danger, Will Robinson, as we said last time. No, Will Robinson, by the way, was a TV, sh- a TV show I found out. That's what that came from. But in other words, it's danger here. If you're, if you're having to... to to say, well, I'll tell you the truth because I this or that, and it's a way of swearing. But we struggle with that, don't we? we if we're honest, we struggle with lying. We, we, we all do in some way, shape, or form, in the form of exaggeration or flattery can even be lying. That you would not only, you would say in front of someone, flattery, the wrong kind of lying is you would say something bef- in front of somebody that you would never say in private. And gossip, just the opposite. You'd say uh, in private what you'd never say in public. There's different ways of lying. And, and I think we have to be, I think as Christians, we think we don't lie. <laughs> because we think it's so simple, we shouldn't be doing that. And yet there's ways in which we shave the truth. The great preacher and writer George MacDonald wrote to his son, And said, I always try, I think I do, to be truthful. At the same time, I tell a great many lies. You know, it's it's there and it can happen in the body of Christ. We we have pressure on us. We want to sometimes look more sanctified than we are. We want to look more holy than we are. And so we shave the truth. And we do this because we want to look better than we actually are. We want to... Look more competent, look more in control, look more this or that, sanctified. We want to justify our actions. And why do we do this? Basically because we're afraid of other people and what they think of us. Instead of being afraid of God and what he thinks of us. That's, That's the fear of the Lord. It's the beginning of wisdom. And so this is what we struggle with. We struggle all the time. Or we think that, 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 get, that somehow if we, we shave the truth, then the truth will somehow get, that, that shaved will get us someplace we want to go, will we'll be to our advantage. And that can happen temporarily, but it always comes back to bite us in the end. People realize we are doing that, and they're less inclined to believe us. It can break up relationships when we don't tell the truth, and people know it. It never works in the long run. And so learn Christian. And I speak to myself as well as everyone else. Keep your word. Speak the truth in love. See your word as your bond. See it as your obligation. See it as your sacred trust. The Lord always speaks to you truthfully, Christian. And therefore you should be like him and not shave the truth. Even when it hurts, even when you might be thought of as less than, we belong to the God of truth, the God who never lies to us. But you might have one other question before we close. Does this mean we can't take an oath in court? Now, there have been people who have said that, Quakers, Moravians, Mennonites, have said, though Jesus is being literal here, we can never take an oath. I don't think that's to take in all of scripture. We need to interpret scripture with scripture and not just focus on one scripture. And the Bible tells us that our Lord was under oath at one point. The high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you going, how are you going to answer? They were making all kinds of accusations. You remember that on the night that Jesus was arrested. 
And, and this, it goes on, Matthew goes on. What, what is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus said, yes. Jesus was under oath. You see, the point Jesus is making here, keep your word. That's what he's talking about here. Not that you could never be under oath. Or Paul in his epistles, the apostle of Jesus Christ, says in Romans, God whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son is my witness. How constantly I remember you. He's, he's calling upon God to be his witness. Or in 2 Corinthians, I call God as my witness that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. Or in Galatians 1, I assure you before God that I am writing you no lie. You see, there's times when we might increase our our language. Even God, Hebrews 6, quotes Genesis 22 where God swore an oath to Abraham that he would keep his word. Even God comes under oath, not because he needs to lie sometimes, not because he's under someone else's uh, authority or under their uh, accountability, but he does it to show us that he keeps his promises always, that he means business when he speaks, that he, his promises cannot not happen. This is an instance where, where, where the Lord takes an oath because, he, because he's condescending to us. He knows that we take oaths. And so he takes an oath by himself, according to himself, so that we'll see that his promise is true. So don't worry about taking an oath in court. It's okay. It's okay when some people don't know who you are and so they, you have to put it on, on the record that you're gonna tell the truth. But to those who know us, to those in the church, to those in our family, we shouldn't ever need an oath. If we do, there's a problem someplace, right? There's a problem. Be a person of your word. Be a person who delivers what you say. Our word should not be, well, that's a possibility. I, I might do that. We'll just see. It's contingent upon other things. We should mean what we say and say what we mean always is what Jesus is saying. Now, let me close with this. Lying breaking the tenth, the ninth commandment is serious. In fact, in the book of Revelation, you might remember that those who are outside the kingdom, and it gives a list of those, and one of those on the list is all liars. And you say, how could God send people to hell for lying? Well, he doesn't send them to hell only for lying, but he could. It's right up there with the other sins of of magic arcs and idolatry. It's mentioned murderers are so mentioned. It's right up there with them. Because all sin sends people to hell. All sin is the very opposite of what we should be. All sin is, is what separates and disconnects us from God. And that's why we need Jesus. We're, we're not Christians because we're always telling the truth. We're not Christians because we're never sinning. We're Christians because we trust in a savior who never sinned. We're Christians because we trust in the faithful one, the one who never lies, never lies, always tells the truth to us. The one who died for sinners is Jesus, the one who calls sinners to himself. So don't think that we're thinking we're better than other people. All we have is by grace alone, by God's gift alone. But what we have is from God, a salvation that takes away all of our sins and sets us on a course to tell the truth, sets us on a course to stay in our marriages, sets us on a course to not, to not lie. That's the good news of the gospel that leads to the good news of a good life before the Lord all the days of our life. Let's close in a word of prayer together. Lord, we ask that you would help us in our lying. Lord, may we not deny it, 
may we not think we never do that. Lord, may we tell the truth. May we trust you enough to tell the truth. Lord, I pray for marriages maybe that are struggling right now and they're wondering, is there an out? Is there relief? Oh Lord, may you help them. May you help your church to help them. That we might help one another come back to the gospel of grace and go on trusting you. Oh Lord, we th- I pray for those who may not be a Christian here, who may have said some things spiritually before, but they're not given over yet to you. Oh Lord, draw them to yourself now. May we trust in you. Our only hope is you. Our only hope is the Savior who died and rose for us. Lord, may we rejoice in that good news together. May we rejoice in the Lamb of God that was slain for the sins of the world. Oh Lord, we give you praise and glory. Help us to be your disciples. Help us to live that righteousness that goes beyond the scribes and the Pharisees. Righteousness of a way of life that is fulfilling, a way of life that is enjoying because we're on the on the way of holiness. We're on the way to heaven. Oh Lord, we give you praise and glory. Now feed us, we pray. And we ask you at your table in Jesus' name. Amen.